I'm going to officially kick it off. I'm so excited. Um, welcome everyone to the Birth Queen podcast. I have a very special guest today, Miss Tanya Lewis Lee. Um, you you hold many crowns, but we know you most right now for producing Aftershock. Thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. But you're also a mommy. You mm -hmm. are a birth queen. So can you share with us um, who you see Tanya as? Mm. And I'm sure that's changed over the years. But like today, who is Tanya? <laughs> today, who is Tanya? Um you know, I really think of myself, um, it's funny, the first thing that comes to mind is my career, right? So I think of myself as someone who is really uh, in conversation about women's health. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who creates content. I'm someone who creates products um, to keep the conversation going for all of us. And, it's, and in a way, it's a little selfish because I need to have the conversation always about trying to stay on my my path and my healthy journey, um, because what I, I love, I'm a sweet tooth person. I love a cookie. I love <laughs> a pie. You know, I do like the carbs. So I have to control myself on that, you know, but I don't, and I say that not just because of I'm concerned about how I look, but like, I really think about like my numbers, like I knock on wood, I'm, I'm, I'm able to stay off medication, um, and I've got good blood pressure. My cholesterol is still pretty good, um, you know, and so I want to keep all those numbers in order so that I can continue to be doing the work that I'm doing mm -hmm. when I'm 94 years old. Yes, right? I love that. Yes, so, cheers to 94. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person who is concerned about my own health and wellness, about the health and wellness of my community, mind, body, and spirit. And I think everything that I do in some way, shape, or form is trying to improve those qualities for myself and everybody else. What, when did that passion reveal itself? I think that... Um, I was able to see the possibility of actually doing it once my daughter was born. That's my oldest child. She's 28, right? But, but the passion for health and wellness started when I was a teenager, an overweight teenager who had to go in, who was going to the doctor for weigh-ins once a week and in conversation with my doctor about how diet and exercise impacts my weight at the time it was really about my weight and then ultimately me ultimately my health so um and i've gone on every i've been on every diet that there ever was i've gone up and down in weight and i will say that it was probably about 15 years ago now when i was like i can't do another diet it's really going to have to be a full-on lifestyle um yeah and i and i see the results of that like i'm healthier i feel better um, and so I'm, I'm a total convert and, and want everyone to feel that way. Yeah. I'm totally the, you know, I'm always sensitive because of my packaging, like how I speak to it. But for me, fitness and wellness was always an internal journey, mm -hmm. not an external one. Um, and I feel like so much of what we see is just one perspective, Agreed. right? And many people that look great do not feel great right and so you know when i have my like trainer coach hat on i'm always like what makes you feel good from food to relationships to yeah. job to to a workout like and i think we got in this culture especially in new york city of like this fitness kind of madness where people were like obsessed and i'm like do you even like going to that place right. <laughs> like, right you know or is that what everybody else is doing so i think also it's that reminder of and especially with women, like our bodies are forever changing in any given week or month. So it's always just kind of checking in with, with what you need to, to nourish yourself, like mind, body, and spirit. So we're very much aligned in yeah. that way. Um, so career wise, um, you know, what was your path? And, and I, I'm going to ask, you know, I don't know that it's a hard question, but because of who your partner in life is as a woman, was that hard for you to like kind of stay your path or have you had to ebb and flow as a result of, of who he is? Yeah. Well, so 
It's interesting because I've always been an artist and a creative person, but I, I, but I didn't know because I come from a very corporate family. My father was in corporate America. My mother was a teacher. My family, we are not artists as a, as, as work. We don't think of it that way. I mean, certainly like my grandmother was a prolific crocheter and when I look back at it, oh my God, of course it was art. It was beautiful. Yeah. But we didn't think of, we didn't think of it that way. Right. Um, But like as a young person, I mean, I was a pianist. I was a really good pianist. Um, I had, I I liked to sing. I I had dreams. I wanted to be a performer, but you know, that was not what we did. So that's not what I was going to do. And then, and then when I went to college, uh, as I was graduating, I was interested in, um, working in television. And I was very clear. I wanted to write, I wanted to direct and produce, but I didn't know anyone in television. I didn't know how to get into the business. And, you know, my parents were kind of like, what are you talking about? You need to go to law school or business school. Right. And so, um, you know, being sort of nervous, I said, you know what, I'll just go to law school and, you know, maybe I'll figure it out from there buy myself some time. Yeah. Um, but I ended up uh, working for Human Rights Watch, uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, thinking I would be a civil rights lawyer, but ultimately ended up um, being uh, a corporate uh, lawyer for a couple of years in Washington, D.C. at a firm. Uh, at the same time, I was trying to um, develop uh, a magazine. A friend of mine and I were trying to develop a magazine, an entertain- a black entertainment magazine, which I was not able to get up off the ground. Around this time, so so a couple of years out, I meet Spike, and um, we decide we're going to get married. It was a very f- fast courtship. Uh, we met in September. We were engaged in December. We were married October. Um, and Spike said to me, you know, because I was planning to find a job in New York at another law firm, and he was like, well, if you really wanted to be creative, why don't you focus on that instead of going to work for a law firm? And I was like, oh, okay, I'll I'll try that. And then I was pregnant six months after we were married. And, um, but what I did was I started writing. Uh, This is how I, this is how I really started. So I started getting up in the morning. Uh, I would write for a few hours a day, just for myself, nothing to show anybody. Uh, And then I had a friend who was working at Nickelodeon uh, who had been uh, uh, with me at my law firm. And I told him I was interested in producing. And he said, well, why don't you come in for an exploratory interview? And uh, that's how I began my producing career. I started working at Nickelodeon, doing very small little um, sort of public service announcements for them. Um, When my children were little, I was watching them. And remember, I had been writing. Um, but then I was watching them, how they were seeing the world. And I was like, there are not enough children's books that feature kids right. that look like them. Somebody should write a, and I was like, well, maybe I should try. And yeah. so that's how I got I to please. Myself growing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's how I got to please baby, please. Cause I was watching my kids kind of trying to navigate this world as Brown kids. And I was like, we need more. Yeah. Um, And so I just kept, I just kept evolving and growing. Um, uh, But the folks at Nickelodeon were, uh, I I did a lot of work there for many years and then just went from there. And, you know, in terms of my, my relationship in my marriage, I will say that having young children and a husband who has a very dynamic career that takes him away from the family and and his focus, someone had to be the rock at home. So I would say that I kept my career kind of on simmer. I always worked, but at a pace that allowed me to be around for my children in mind and physically, um, with the idea that once they got older, that I would then be able to go hard, uh, which is what I've been able to do. So it's, 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 it's been good. And and I will say this too. I mean, Spike has been extremely supportive of my uh, creative um, endeavors. And uh, I think, you know, there's a term of the shadow artist. Um, and I think that's what I was for many years. All of my friends were artists. I ended up marrying an amazing artist right. uh, to get myself to where I really originally wanted to be. <laughs> 
Yeah, I feel like after once you started that story, I'm like, you manifested him I, in a way. Like, kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it's like most of our parents are like, no, you're not going to be an artist. Like, yeah. what are you thinking? <laughs> yeah. My father was like, and, and it's like, you need to make money. I know you, you need, you need to work and make money. And, yeah. and look, I, and I appreciate that. Like I can now as an adult, I get that. Like he, he wanted to make sure that I was financially solid. Um, yeah. But at the same time, and, and didn't understand that there is a way, it's hard, but that there is a way to be an artist and be financially solid too. Yeah. And I think that's, it's just uncharted territory, exactly. but I think there is also this illusion that corporate America is safe. <laughs> <laughs> And that is so true. And it's so funny you say that. I so appreciate that because I have this debate with my parents even now. I'm like, it's like everything. Like you can, there's some people who will get to the top, tippy, tippy top. And there's some people who will languish. And it's the same thing in art. There's some people who will just explode. And then there's some people who just won't. It's just the way it goes. Yeah. And I also think it's like, what are your, I talk to my manager about this a lot. Like, what are your priorities? Like for me, I always needed to be a mom. Like that, I knew from the moment I landed on this planet that that was, that had yeah. to happen, right? I was very clear about that. And so that was my probably ultimate focus outside of everything else. And, you know, entering this world as an actor and being young, it was, it's hard because it's, there are a lot of illusions. Right. <laughs> In any field you're in. I'm sure even as an attorney, right? You're like, there's ideas of what things are versus realities. And um, our culture does not support women being mothers and being uh, workers, which we always have been. And yet, okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean, always have been, <laughs> but yet the culture doesn't support it. And so you're kind of stuck trying to manage it all it's so it's it's so unfair but and there's a better way to do it where we all benefit but that's not how how it works yeah i know i was actually to that point um i lobbied for the first time a couple weeks ago and we were talking one of the pillars we were lobbying for was paid leave right child care and this idea that we're, we don't want to leave the workforce Trust me, after the pandemic, I was like, can't wait to go back to work. I'm right. a better working mom than I am full-time mother. Um, but it is it is unfair. I think that's, I am so not the person that walks around like life is unfair, but there are crippling moments as a mother who works that are, it's just unfair. Well, and we it's- have to Totally. And it's about a patriarchy because the idea is you get married, you get a husband, a husband pays your bill so you could be at home and take care of the child. But who does that work for? Like what percentage of the population? Like it's, it's, it's this, this archaic idea of what it means to be a woman. And yet we're all caught up. I, one of the midwives from my film Aftershock, it, um, said to us one day, she was saying that this concept of, you know, working hard throughout your pregnancy, working up until the day that you give birth and then getting right back to work is comes out of the system of slavery. And oh, we totally. are and we are all now caught up in that system. And that's the American way, which is from enslavement. Why would any of us want to operate like that? How does a society function like that? I'm sorry, I don't mean to get on my soapbox, but it's no, just insane. Well, listen, you open the door, so I'm happy to walk through it because I talk about, I had the privilege of going to um, uh, the Aspen Institute for mm -hmm. a, a Socrates seminar with uh, Dr. Michelle. Um, and um, why is her last name? It, it's going to come back to me. Uh -huh. But we were talking about you know, reproductive rights in the justice system. And so she was like, everybody here is going to want to talk about abortion. And she's like, nope, 
we're going to talk about slavery and we're going to talk about how we're in this predicament because white men designed this country to ensure that black women, white women and natives did not have rights. Exactly. And so when I come into my conversation about this whole black maternal health crisis, I'm like, we, we got to roll it way back. Maternal health, period. Women's rights, period were never intended to exist in the United States of the exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that and, is why we are and, here. Right. And that's why I get so frustrated because I'm I, like amongst other things, but it's like white women, you have to show up for black women. And, yep. and, and, and if you don't, you're not showing up for yourself. And that's, right. that's often where the miss is to your point. They want to jump over and talk about abortion. Right. I mean, I remember this conversation um, right after uh, the de- um, uh, uh, after after Roe v. Wade was overturned, and there was this thing where it's like, well, you know, in the 1800s, it was legal for women to get abortions, and I was like, for whom was it legal? Because slavery was still going Not on for us, because they were monetizing. Our exactly. Babies. So, and and I and the look on women's fa- white women's faces when I said this was like like I slapped them, because it was like oh shit, right? Like yes, because you keep forgetting, which is why we're in this predicament. You you keep forgetting, and so it's just we got you know women. We got a lot of we got a lot of work to do to build a coalition. Yes, and it's Dr. Michelle Goodwin. Sorry. Ah, Michelle. good, no, good. Like, oh, I was I was sitting there <laughs> nerding out, like so happy to just digest all of her brilliance. She's amazing. But yeah, and I think it's also just taking. She's so classy and brilliant too in her delivery, and I mean, even just how she presents. Mm. And it's, it was this example of let's just sit here and unpack facts. Right. And so. Right. All we're doing and all I'm interested in doing in all of this work is unpacking the facts and implementing solutions. But until you, we are willing, all of us to see the truth, we cannot heal or provide and implement lasting solutions. It's not possible. It is not possible. You are absolutely right. You know, so that I think is a, a wonderful segue into like how how and and why aftershock um for you and thank you aftershock if anyone has not watched it run to hulu is it anywhere else now or just no just hulu okay um but yes tell us the story of 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 aftershock i'm more interested of course like tell us what it's about but like your journey yeah personally getting there and professionally like making it happen because I think it's inspiring to people, to women to, to hear how, how that came about. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it, again, it, it's like everything, everything, one, everything you do leads to something else. Right. So what I mean by that is like, I wrote my children's books. I wrote, please, baby, please, please, puppy, please. And then in 2007, the U S department of health and human services asked me to be a spokesperson for their infant mortality awareness raising campaign here in the United States. Um, and because of the children's work that I had done they, they knew I cared about children. And so I had no idea, uh, that the U.S. had an infant mortality crisis problem at the time, traveled the country, uh, and really found myself immersed in a world of women's health, because when you're talking about infant's health, you're talking about women's health. Yeah. Um, and uh, was speaking to groups of women. And I, I, and I, I was with the campaign for over a decade uh, and really had the privilege of traveling the country from all, like rural, urban, north, south, east, west, all over the place. Um, specifically talking to black women uh, and would have groups of women and inevitably someone would tell me about someone they knew who passed away from childbirth complications. So as we were talking about infant health and wellness, I was hearing about this maternal issue, not maybe not at the beginning, really connecting the dots fully. Right. So I made a small film uh, on uh, called crisis in the crib uh, for the department of health and human services. Um, I had been producing some other projects had just finished producing uh, the film Monster, uh, which is now on Netflix. That's the adaptation of the Walter Dean Myers novel that's about criminal justice and sort of the over-incarceration of our, of our youth. Um, 
uh, not a documentary narrative film, uh, and was thinking about this maternal mortality issue and how to approach it as a film. And uh, then Linda Villarosa wrote a piece for the New York Times uh, about the issue. And yeah. I thought to myself, I, it, now is the time. I'm finished this film, now is the time, I need to get going on this. Um, and so, uh, so sort of began the process. Uh, it turns out that my co-producing and co-directing partner, Paula Eiseld, was also uh, working on a project. Um, she had just begun, she had a little bit of development funding, um, a woman named um, Don Porter, uh, who is a dear friend of mine, who's also a producer, was consulting on that project and said, Tanya, you should come on to this film. And I was like, OK, um, I didn't know Paula, but, you know, we had a shared vision. We wanted yeah. to tell the story of what we call the U.S. maternal mortality crisis, specifically as it uh, is impacting black and brown communities through the lived experience of people who have dealt with the issue. We wanted to also make sure that we got through the statistics of what was happening. And we did not, while we knew people would go on an emotional journey, we wanted to leave people feeling inspired and empowered uh, when they left the film. Uh, and so, you know, it was to me, it, it was my official directorial debut. Um, and, um, you know, it, it was, it was a tough thing. I mean, you know, we, we meet people who are very early in their grief after, uh, losing women to childbirth complications, but these are people who at the same time really wanted to have the conversation with community about what was happening. They wanted to amplify the voices. So they were incredible partners to work with on the film. Uh, and, um, it's, and it, and it's been amazing. I mean, uh, I think we really, because we were so clear on the vision of what we wanted to do, we were able to make the film in the way we wanted to make it. We raised the funds for the film. We premiered it at Sundance. We sold it to Honest Collective and ABC News, and it's now on Hulu. We've had many, many, uh, impact screenings in community, also at hospitals, med schools, um, uh, and uh, insurance companies, uh, people are really using the film for uh, inspired conversation. Um, and so it's been amazing. It's been an amazing, uh, who would have thought, and I got to tell you, you know, at the beginning, there were people who were like, oh, a film about uh, black women dying from childbirth complications. You're never going to be able to do that. Oh, you'll only be able, that budget is too high. You need to lower the budget. Uh, no. I'm going, we'll, we'll be able to do it. We raised the money. Oh, you know, I don't know about a sale. You're not going to get a, you know, we sold it and, you know, we did pretty good. <laughs> oh, I don't know about like, no, but we were able to get it out there. So um, I'm, I'm really proud of, of what we were able to accomplish and grateful to those families and everyone who participated in the film. Well, I appreciate, number one, the film is is wonderful and had to be made. So thank you. But I that last bit, I appreciate you sharing that just to, to remind people to keep going because yeah. a lot of times, you know, you're the one with the vision and that's why it's a vision because exactly. it came to you <laughs> exactly. and everybody can't see it until it's done. done and it's a lot of work. And I also want to highlight that you have been all over the place. Yes. <laughs> like A year. Uh, yeah, it, you haven't stopped. Do you know yeah. how many miles you've traveled? I don't, but it's been a lot. I'm a diamond. I'm a diamond plus member at a Delta. Like it's been a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, how many outfit changes? Yeah, many, it, I, I just want to be the the BTS of the wardrobe. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's been it's been a lot. It's been again. It's and it and that's amazing because people wanted to have the conversation. We created something. Yep. That allowed. A conversation to happen and we don't have all the answers i i don't have all the answers that's why the film can be a catalyst for great conversation i have my opinions that people may disagree with but let's have that conversation too it's all it's all good right i mean i think that's what's important is like we have to come to the table cross sector which is so awesome about 
Aftershock being a tool in all of those sectors, mm -hmm. like from the payer to the community to this, that, and the third, like we all have to come and say, okay, like hopefully that's that neutralizing force to just generate open dialogue. Yeah. Because again, like it takes all perspectives and acknowledgement of fact for us to fix this. Yeah. Um, and I think anytime you deal with race and death, tensions are high, people are sensitive, but I think you, you know, with me, with this, it's like, you can't be careful. Like people are yeah. dying at the most exactly. beautiful and vulnerable time of their lives. It's and it's preventable. They're dying yes. from preventable deaths. That's yeah. like, <laughs> like 80%. And I always knew that 60 number was right. Wrong. And it's probably even higher than 80. Right. Um, that's what we've been able to prove because those are the only the people that, you know, have been documented and we were able to whatever confirm. Um, and we know there are things that are hidden and blah, blah, blah. Exactly. But it's, it's just, um, you know, I tell people too, I just was telling you, I just did my dinner series for birth queen. And it was like, what, what was uncovered is it's also hard for a black person to digest that no matter your status in life, it is the color of your skin that would be the reason you die. That someone like doesn't value you because of your complexion. Like that is a hard truth to swallow. And so that's why now, you know, the median income of a black woman being affected is 128,000 because we're like, oh, well, I have a PPO and I have a right. master's and I right. have money in the bank. So I'm good. We're not. And, that's and, and by the way, I mean, <laughs> we live in a, a culture that's hostile to exactly that being successful and overcoming that like like it is hostile to us as black women especially black women and men but as black women we live in a culture that is hostile to us you know and we have too much power we have too much political power um you know uh and i, I think about all of the what's happening you know with diversity equity inclusion and all the rollbacks you know and i, I what i what i'm saying to myself is like we're we the we have the appearance of doing too well clearly. Otherwise they wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> so we well, need to keep on keeping on what we're doing. Yeah, Because it is this thing of, we have to be the best to get into the room right? and get a seat at a table. But then if we're too good, they remove us. Exactly. And, and that's so, a lot of stress on the body, by the way. Uh, yeah which is called weathering if people exactly. don't know. And so, but it's also us understanding like generational trauma like lives in us. I, I was so grateful when the, I think I was pregnant with my first on my way to Philly randomly. I remembered it mm -hmm. and I was like, thank you. There was this research that hit the New York Times that said it has nothing like black women and babies are not dying because we don't get prenatal care no. because we all have high blood pressure. We're no. all overweight and poor and all this no. foolishness. It's because our cells die at a faster rate due to the stress that we've endured since being shipped over here, not getting here. Right. But like we kind of forget about this middle passage. Thing. Oh, yeah. We kind of also forget about being caged for months. Oh, yeah. I, I, I went to the castle. I was recently in Ghana and went to those castles. I saw and understood the depth of hum inhumanity that happened there. It's what we have endured is and we're still here. <laughs> Like it's right. really, it's really amazing. So, right. So we've got the, the cellular trauma, but that's not what's killing us. Really. What's really no. killing us is, yeah. is yeah. the, the racism that from our healthcare providers, right? Like, I think we can, we could overcome some of that if we weren't dealing with healthcare providers again, who are hostile to us. Yeah. And it's, I don't, and, and that's the thing that's so hard. Like, how, how do you, how do you fix racism? Right. That's, that's, that's what we're really trying to do. And I don't know. Right. I mean, I think though, when I founded birth queen for me, it's like, I didn't really want to touch the system. Cause I'm like, how do I sit and dismantle racism? Even though people are like, I don't know who else would kind of go in there and talk to people other than you. I had a lot of fun actually lobbying in the Republican offices 
Oddly enough, I don't know if the actor in me was like, I'm gonna try a different tactic. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna put this Juilliard training to work. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, but I think the place to start for me as a solution oriented person is like, okay, we know that if black people across the board with any health provider, but specifically with black maternal health, if we have black midwives and black doulas and what's left out of the conversation often are black lactation counselors mm. as we saw with that horrific story in texas where they're taking a baby calling it jaundice horrible <sighs> um and then feeding it formula so i just like that whole story I, I was sick to my stomach but it's it's training a workforce it's a very tangible solution and so i hope that people you know when they listen and learn like yes there's this huge Thing called racism that's going to take a lot of work. And in the meantime, if we train a workforce that is quickly, like it's a faster training than any, you know, obstetrics training. And it's very effective and has exactly. been since like the beginning, the beginning of, of time. time. <laughs> like, we all were born into the hands of a midwife. Women gave birth in communion with women. This is what we've been doing. And then they breastfed the babies. That's right. That's how, that's that's how it works. That's how it works. And, and it has worked and it works and it's better and it's better. And it it's not works. that hard. It's not no. that hard. And then let us rest as women. Exactly. You know? We need to rest. And Look at some other things. cultures. Look at other cultures, what the A Asian cultures Asian say. Culture, you can't move for a exactly. month. Exactly. And I love that. Yes. Like, you know, it's. And then I think the pressure in our head of like the idea of all these things that we should be popping up to do. I, I, I tell this funny story, like <laughs> after I had my first, um, that Coming to America is like probably my favorite movie. But after I, it, I had it. three hours of labor and pushed for three hours, I, I entered the threshold of my apartment building and I was like, where the fuck are my rose petals at my feet? Like, <laughs> I was like... Why are women wow. like mothers need to be like everybody wow. needs to just be bowing down to mothers because yeah. by the way, you wouldn't be here without one. That well, the patriarchy is not going to have it because they know that's the whole key. I, I think that's the key to it all. Right. Like I, I like, oh, why, why take away? And I'm, I don't want women to suffer. And I, and by the way, I did have epidural. So like, this is, uh, you know, but I, what I've come to really believe is that there is a reason we're supposed to feel what we feel when we go through labor. To, we have to tap into that because, and then, and then you bring forth this, this life and you know, if you can do that, you can do anything. Like, cause yeah. as, as one of the midwives says to, to, to me, when a woman is birthing a child, she's not just birthing a child, she's birthing a mother, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so why are we not focused on the sacredness, the, the rite of passage that is happening for women when you yes. become a, a powerful mother, <laughs> yes. because the patriarchy is afraid of that. Yes. And, but we have to claim it. We have to take it back. Which is why I founded Birth Queen, which I is why it. this podcast is called Birth Queen, because we have to remember that. Like, And yes, my focus with this podcast, with my nonprofit is Black women, but it's women. If we exactly. all wake up and we're, we recognize our power, that's the last thing these men want. Exactly. That's why they're keeping the pressure on, so that we feel, so that we don't see it. It's like a ma It's like a. It's like we've been like there's been a hex or something, some sort of spell put on us. Yeah. Where we kind of feel like, oh no, we don't have power. We have all the power. You all because the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Yes. And it still does. And wars have been ended like by literally women crossing their legs. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I had a room laughing that, you know, that we were like, after we lobbied, actually, I was like, you know, if you don't work and that's not your mode of power, throw on a negligee, girl. Right. Like, <laughs> and, you know, I'm I'm an Oakland girl who's lived in Harlem half her life. So I, listen, I that that concept for me coming up was right. Tough. Right. And. I think that's also part of the effery of this overdrive of like feminist, which it, it mm, takes away our feminine. Totally. And puts us in our masculine. Right. And I don't think I don't want to be a man. I don't. I'm a woman and I want to, and I want to be all that I can be about that. Right. Like I fully. My, 
our power is in all of our pieces. Exactly. And so much of our power is in the fact that we're soft. Right. But this world has driven us to be hard, which to me deteriorates a lot of partnerships because it's like, right. there's no balance. Right. I think even in a, you know, a, a homosexual like partnership, there's still somebody- Feminine, there's gotta feminine, be a, feminine, and, feminine and masculine energy. There's gotta be that kind of- There's balance. It has exactly. to be. Um, and we see it all the time. Like, no, it's not this, it, 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 they're just, and I think there's, there's uh, beauty in that. Like when you, you know, I, and I want there to be that softness and space for men too, right? Like if they can fall into us and I can fall into you, it's like kneading dough. It, exactly. It, it comes over and under. And I think there's not a lot of space if we bring it back to women and motherhood, there's no time for us to lay down. No, 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 there isn't. You got to keep... You know, and you can't even is, have space to think. Girl, like, you know, those moments when you're like, you know, the thing, the thing I need. Yes. To <laughs> but this is the beauty, though, of getting older, um, because like I said, my children, my daughter's 28, my son's 26. And I will say that, and, and this is the wellness piece, right? Like, and I, I you know, there's this like, you know, people will talk about self-care and this and that, and, and it can get far out. But the, but the truth is, it's like keeping the body strong, healthy, the mind good, good energy, keep yourself learning, uh, feel connected to something bigger than yourself. You get, you, you, if you live long enough, kids grow up a little bit, then you, there is space for self to kind of really get in there. And I, I have to say, I think the 50s, are and um, can be an amazing time in a woman's life and i think that's the other trick that's been played on us there's oh, so much yeah. conversation about menopause and oh menopause it's so bad oh it's so bad you got the hot flashes oh menopause it's a bad it's bad menopause is not bad there is nothing bad about menopause it's all in how you approach it and think about it and i'm not saying some you people have the 50s look great girl just saying. Uh, well well thank you but i'm just saying we sometimes we, we're so busy focusing on the negative oh, that we're that we miss out on actually the beauty and the joy of what it means to be a woman of a certain age with a little less responsibility hope you know if you're lucky enough where you know your children are able to do well enough i mean you know i'm still parenting but you know um yeah. and i've got i've got stuff to do that is meaningful you're, to you're me. not done you, at all i love i'm just Thank getting you. going yeah i mean I at it. 50 you can start another career and still have a 25 year career yeah. It is, you've got the world ahead of you. It is an amazing time. And you're smarter, you're more confident, <laughs> and, and you really kind of don't care what most people think anymore. <laughs> yeah, and if you still do, please stop. Please stop Exactly. <laughs> I hope, like I tell all women, by 30, right. if you haven't stopped giving an F right. about what you think about you, hurry and find somebody to help you. Right. Exactly. Well, at 30, okay. <laughs> and I would say, I, I give you 30, I give you 30 to 40, but by yeah. 50, by 50, but, but it's saying, real, like, you real. Boy, so much more of your 30. Well, it's true. It's true. Like, put that silliness to bed. Yeah. And, and you've never, I think what it is too, which, what you're really saying is you you never arrive. Right, no. And I think that's an illusion that we're like, you we're the, there's a final destination. That right, to no. me is the grave. So either- It's a constant evolution. You hope you're always evolving. You know, you're yeah. always evolving. Okay, so I could talk to you forever, but I always like to ask people two questions. Yeah. So one, what is your biggest push moment in your life? It doesn't have to be giving birth. Mm. My biggest push moment. Look, I, I got to say, I just think it's like raising children. I mean, I, 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 I raising my children, like getting them through their teenage young adult life like that, that and really that part like that, 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 that high school, college age, like just kind of keeping them focused and, you know, hard, but good. <laughs> and you gave me like a little tidbit that I won't share, but what are you giving birth to next? 
Um, I am, well, I'm, I'm writing right now. I'm writing a few things, but I'm also, um, I'm executive producing uh, an, a documentary film about the um, uh, seven time uh, gold medalist, uh, Allison Felix. So oh, really, really excited about that. Uh, really excited about that. I think she's amazing. And I look forward to people really understanding who she is and, and what she Oh, is. I love this. My yeah. girlfriend, her and my girlfriend are neighbors. Like, oh, kids, like I love there's that. Something like, there's a community out there. My girlfriend happens to be friends with like a lot of track. Okay. Folks. So the world is very small. It is. Um, it is. I love that. No, I hear she's like absolutely lovely. Yes. And I bought her. She has a sneaker line called Sage. And like, this is like, I'm just, I, I love those shoes. I have to tell you, they're great. Like, you know, okay. so so everybody buy a pair. check okay. out Allison Felix's shoes. And you know what she does? She says, because when women are pregnant, their feet tend to grow. And so if you buy her shoes and then you get pregnant, you can return them and get a new size for your larger feet for free. I love that. My last kid made my eyesight go and my foot grow. Oh, <laughs> and if you had to say shoes, you would have gotten a free pair for your new larger feet. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and we, we, speaking of shoes and this documentary, we, we got to talk a little bit more about some intel that you might be able to add Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Uh -huh. <laughs> I say that for the documentary though. <laughs> exactly. It's a, little, it's a little sweet tea. Yes, moment. yes. Um, well, I appreciate you so much and I feel so special that um our worlds collided. I know last summer it, it kind of seemed like I was stalking you. I saw you everywhere. I know, I know, and it and it's so funny though. Like I said, I've really been thinking about you. So um so yeah. yeah I yeah. love I love the way life works. And I know we were supposed to record in February and then I booked a film, so I was out of town. And then it's just timing, right? Like Right, exactly. Yeah. So, Sometimes you just got to flow with the universe. Can't force it. Can't push it. Just do. No. Well, we thank you, Tanya. We can't wait to watch the new documentary with Allison and everybody go watch Aftershock. Yes, and I hope you have a blessed day. Thank you. You too, Rachel. Thank you.